Can you wave your hands? Okay, great. How many of you follow our church on social media? Raise your hands. How many follow us on social media? That's great. Can we give our social media team a big hand? Let's give them a hand for all the work that they're doing. Yep. Almost every day they're doing something in, in social media for us. And if you're not on our church uh, chat, on the back of the black chairs, there is a QR code that you can scan and get on the uh, church uh, news feed so you know that we're doing. In our day and age, social networking is everywhere. We're very familiar with, with the term followers. Yeah? We constantly see advertisements, uh, information. Follow us on Twitter, or now X. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. Follow our blog. Everywhere, people are asking us to follow them. On Facebook, followers are called friends. On LinkedIn, they're called connections. On YouTube, they're called what? Subscribers. <laughs> All of these terms just really mean the same thing. They, they designate people who are followers. Well, why do people follow on social media? Well, they, they follow for lots of different reasons. They follow for personal reasons. For example, on Facebook, they want to know uh, friends, what they're doing. They want to keep in touch with their friends. They want to see pictures of how the children are growing up or where they're going on vacation. Some people follow for professional reasons. They want to know what is happening in their sphere of business and they're following different companies. Some people are following because they have some type of favorite actor, some type of favorite music group or their hobbies and, their, and they, they want to follow because they like the content that they see. There, there's lots of different reasons for following. Following isn't new to our society. Following was even back in Jesus' day and even earlier than that. When we read the Word of God, and also when we look around today, we see people who are following Jesus for different reasons. Some follow Jesus for good reasons, and some follow Jesus for, let's say, not the best reasons. When Jesus started his public ministry, he called on people to follow him. So if you have your Bible, we're also going to have here on the screen some, some Bible verses to look at. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. And it says this, about Jesus. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately there left their, met, their nets, and they followed him. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. This is the very first followers of Jesus. A little bit further in Matthew 9, verse 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose, and he followed Jesus. We see in these verses and in different verses in the New Testament that Jesus specifically called 12 people to follow him. Those were the, the first 12 disciples. But lots of other people followed Jesus as well, aside from the 12. 
there was a group of women that were following Jesus and they were taking care of the needs of the disciples. We see that after the resurrection there, Jesus appeared to 500 of his followers. We see in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, we see 120 of his followers gathered together. Jesus had many followers and he also had crowds of people who followed him. Matthew chapter four, verse 25 says this, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Matthew 8, one. And when, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. I'd like for you to think a minute. Why were these crowds following Jesus? Were they following Jesus because they believed he was the Messiah? Because they believed he was God? Because they acknowledged his lordship in their lives? Or maybe they were following him for what they can get from him. Jesus, everywhere he went, he healed the sick. So maybe they were following just to get healed. Everywhere Jesus went, he cast out demons. So maybe they were just following to be free from demonic oppression, free from their problems, their addictions. Sometimes where Jesus went, people were brought back to life. Maybe they were following with a hope of bringing back to life their child or their spouse. In this great crowds that were following Jesus, I'm sure that there was a, a wonderful atmosphere that everyone seemed happy, everyone seemed blessed, everyone seemed joyful. And, and who wouldn't want to be in a group of followers where everybody is happy, where everybody is excited, where everyone is having a good time? Some follow Jesus for the free food. Let's look at this story of the feeding of the 5,000. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing, but just take a look at a few verses of this. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing with the sick. And we get into the story and we see that there's 5,000 people there. He's been uh, teaching all day. And he turns to the disciples. He says, you know, where are we going to get food to feed all these th people? And there was some fish. There was some bread. And we know the story about how Jesus multiplies the fish and the bread. And verse 17, it says, and when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, go and gather the leftover fragments that nothing could be lost. And so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. So there was so much food from just the couple fish and bread that 5,000 people ate and they ate and they ate till they couldn't eat anymore. And there were still 12 basketfuls of food left over. Verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him and force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. We need to go back in time a little bit. Israel is under Roman occupation. They are a country that Foreign oppressors have come in and have taken over and have, and have uh, forced all their rules and regulations and taxes on them. And there were people that were hoping, let's just kick out these Romans. And they saw in Jesus, oh, this is a good deal. Let's make him our king. He'll throw out the Roman occupiers. He'll heal us when we're sick. He'll fix all of our problems. And we won't have to work anymore. He'll feed us. That's a good deal. 
We won't have any more worries. We won't have any more problems. But you know what? Jesus saw their motivation in following him because he left that place. He crossed over uh, on a boat to the other side and they went go to go looking for him. They found him on the other side. In John chapter 6, verse, verses 25 to 27, it says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are not seeking me because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. They weren't following Jesus because they knew he was God. They were following Jesus for a free meal. That's pretty sad, huh? They didn't follow because they saw the signs that he was the Messiah. They followed only for what they could get from Jesus. They didn't care what Jesus' purpose was. They had their own plans for Jesus. They weren't interested in being reconciled with God. They weren't interested in changing their lives. They weren't interested in turning from their sins. They weren't interested in making Jesus the Lord of their life. They were interested really in only themselves. At one point in time, Jesus is teaching and he, he teaches something that was hard for many of his followers to understand or accept. And in John chapter 6, verses 66 to 69, it says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter says, Jesus, we're not following you because of some earthly benefits. We're not following you for egoistic reasons. We recognize who you are. We recognize that you are God. We recognize that you are worthy of our devotion. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of everything that we can give to you. Not that we're looking to get something from you. Why do people today follow Jesus? Or, or why do they come to church? I think we can probably, in a general way, narrow it down to two categories. There might be a lot more categories, but I think generally two categories. People follow Jesus and people come to church because of what they think he can do for them. People come to Jesus because they think that, well, he'll just fix all my problems. Or they follow Jesus because they think that they'll have some type of financial reward. People come to Jesus because they think, well, he'll just make my life better. Or they come to Jesus because they think, well, maybe he will heal me. Such people are just like the people 2,000 years ago. The crowd who one day is following Jesus and is shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the next day they're shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Because he wasn't all that they thought that he should be. One day, Everything is going great. Everyone is being healed. Everyone is happy. Everyone is fed. And then the next day, let's crucify him. 
they follow Jesus for selfish reasons. They only thought about what they can get here and now on earth. But I think there's other people, another group of people, who follow Jesus because they believe what he says about the Father. They believe what he says about himself. And they believe what he says about us as human beings. Our motivation for following Jesus should come from recognizing who he is and who we are. Real Christians follow Jesus because he is the son of God. They believe that without him, they'll be in bondage to their sin, in unable to escape the results of their sin, which is death and eternal separation from God. Real Christians believe that in him only is there forgiveness of sins. In him there is new life. The truth of Jesus' resurrection should compel us to trust in him, that he is God, that he is worthy of all of our praise, worthy of all of our love, our obedience, our devotion. Real Christians don't follow Jesus for what they can get. They follow Jesus because they realize what they've already received. And they want to give him their life. They want to give him their love. They want to give him their devotion. And they want to give his love that they received to other people. The beauty of the gospel is this, that when we trust Jesus and our motives are pure, he pours out into us more than we could have expected or even hoped for. We said that followers, for example, on YouTube are subscribers or on LinkedIn, their connections. Followers of Jesus, what are they called? They're called disciples. A disciple is someone who is a student of a teacher and he desires to become like the teacher in words and in action, in character, in life. Matthew 16, 24 says this. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus here, he is speaking to his followers. He's speaking to his disciples. He's not speaking to some other group of people. He's speaking to those that are, that are the closest to him. And he says this, if anyone, any one of you, are you in anyone? Do we have any anyones here? Yeah, we're all anyones, yeah? If anyone would come after me or would follow me, let him deny himself. Or the NIV and other translations said, he must deny himself. Well, what does it mean to deny Deny is to state that something is not true. Did you take that cookie from the cookie jar? No, I didn't. I deny that. So deny is to say, no, something is not true. It's to refuse to agree to something. It's to withhold from doing something or refuse to acknowledge or recognize. So what does it mean to deny oneself? It means to deny satisfying our own desires, our own needs. So Jesus says, you must deny yourself. You need to stop putting yourself first in your life. And you need to put me first in your life. You need to refuse your desires, your plans, your dreams, all the things that you want they have to become less important. 
It goes against the natural desires of our flesh because our natural desires always cry out to us, me, I need to be first. My needs and my desires have to be first. Everyone around me should bless me, should help me, should support me. But Jesus says, you need to take that me off of being number one in your life. It says you need to deny yourself and you need to take up your cross. In other words, there is a price to pay for following Jesus. Yes, salvation is free, but it costs Jesus everything. It costs his, his life. It costs him being falsely accused beaten, tortured, and crucified on the cross. Salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap for Jesus. We can't pay for our salvation. We can't give enough money. We can't do enough good works. Some people think, you know, if I just do more good than bad, it will weigh out and, and God will accept me. No, that's not it. Jesus says you need to take up your cross. You need to be willing to pay the price. The cross back then, uh, sometimes today we wear crosses as jewelry on our necks or on a ring or, or something else. The cross was not a piece of jewelry back then. When people saw a cross, they saw an instrument of torture. They saw a man who was carrying a cross and he was a, a walking dead man. And they knew that his end was near. So Jesus says, you need to take your cross. You need to be willing to die to your old way of life so that you can live to a new way of life. And the third thing is, he said, and you need to follow me. Follow Jesus in the way that he lived. Devoted to his father, resisting temptation, loving others, helping others, looking to please the Father. Following Jesus means following him also in his actions, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. A disciple is someone who, who watches, who listens and learns, and then he starts doing the same things as his teacher, as his master because he wants to become like his teacher, like his master. Now, in the Christian life, that's our goal. We're not going to be perfect. None of us are ever going to be exactly like Jesus, but that should be our, our model, that, uh, something that our goal that we set our eyes on, set our hearts on. I want to be more like Jesus to look more like Jesus, to talk more like Jesus, to act more like Jesus. To follow means that you trust Jesus with all aspects of your life. All the first disciples, when Jesus called them, they left their jobs and they followed him. They trusted him. They left their jobs, their livelihoods, their families to follow a stranger from Nazareth, simply because he invited them to. To follow Jesus means to obey Jesus. We don't have the pleasure to pick and choose the things that we'll obey. We read something in the Bible, oh, okay, I can do that. We read something else in the Bible, no, I'm not going to do that. We don't have the privilege to pick and choose. If you're a follower of Jesus, you obey whether you like it or you don't like it. To follow Jesus means to be with Jesus. The first 12 disciples, they were with Jesus. To follow Jesus means we should be with him in prayer, in reading his word, and letting him talk to us when we read his word and, and when we're praying. Will we be perfect? No, of course not. But we should try our best, and when we fail, we should just repent and ask for forgiveness and ask God, 
get me up again and help me get back on the right path. I'd like to ask you this morning, what is your motivation for following Jesus? Is it because you've recognized that he is your creator? Is it because that you know that you are a sinner and without Jesus, you can't be set free from your sin? Are you a follower of Jesus because you just want to please God the Father? Are you a follower of Jesus because you want to be more like him? At the end of every sermon, we usually give the opportunity for people to, to respond. Sometimes when Pastor Clint is here preaching or I'm preaching, you know, sometimes one or two people might come forward. Sometimes no one comes forward. I think ma many, very often people are thinking, well, if I come forward and people see me come forward for prayer, they're going to think that there's something that's wrong with me. So I better not come forward for prayer, and that way people think I'm perfect. Yeah? Let's not let our egos get in the way from coming forward for prayer when there's a call after the sermon. If God speaks to us in church, let's respond to that and, and deal with it and not just think about what are other people going to think about me if I come forward. If you've never really given your life to Christ today and you realize that you've not been following Jesus in imitating who he is and you'd like to change that today I'm going to ask you to stand up and come forward for prayer when we start uh, the next song and myself and Pastor Clint and if it's necessary other people will be up here to pray for you because we want the best for you in your life I'm going to ask you to come forward and make a commitment to Christ if you've never made a commitment before. If you've only been coming for all the earthly benefits, but you never thought about the eternal benefits, today is your day to say, Jesus, I want you as the Lord of my life, and I want to start obeying you and following you. Or maybe you've made that decision and you are today a follower of Jesus and you just need a little bit of a, a push and a little bit of a shove to, to do a better job at that. So I'm going to ask you also to come forward for prayer. Shinka, if we can have the worship team come forward. I believe that God has good plans for each one of us here. And if you are far away from him, today you can change that. And today, you can be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Today you can change from following just for temporary physical benefits to following because you love Jesus and you've acknowledged that yeah, he is the Lord of my life. So I'm going to be down here in the front and Pastor Clint to pray for you.